Well, it's good to be with you again today. I hope that your day is going well so far. We've pretty much finished up Chapter 2, and let's go ahead and get organized for our lesson today. You want to have on hand activities, Activity 2-4, which is Distinguishing Terms, and then your Test 2, if you'll be taking that today. On the agenda for today, we are going to look at a Mount St. Helens clip towards the beginning. Then we will be reviewing some things from Chapter 2. You can break for your test and then pick up with Chapter 3 preview. Now our focus this chapter has been on the Earth's surface and we began by discussing the Earth's history, focusing on creation and the flood, those two periods. And we ended with looking at different forces that affect the Earth's surface today. And this video from the Institute for Creation Research explores evidence that the flood could have made dramatic changes in the landscape in only a few weeks, not millions of years, as some scientists suppose. And we're going to watch three brief portions in which geologist Steve Austin examines rapid changes caused by the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. Well, here's the ray I remember Mount St. Helens before the eruption, 9,677 feet tall, a very symmetrical profile volcano. It had to be the most gorgeous place on the surface of the Earth, absolutely beautiful. Spirit Lake there, directly north of the volcano. Uh, just absolutely gorgeous. Here's what it looked like after the eruption. The volcano lost 1,300 feet of summit elevation on the morning of May 18th as one half cubic mile of landslide material, summit and north slope, slid off the top of the mountain. One qu quarter of the landslide material, or one eighth of a cubic mile, slid down into the Spirit Lake Basin displacing the water of the lake up to 860 feet above the pre-eruption level. That's right, a wave or series of waves went crashing up on the north shore of the lake, three football fields high. The lake sloshed back into its new basin with a dam at the southwest corner, showing us this uh, a completely altered terrain. Simultaneously, three-eighths of a cubic mile of landslide material went down to the west, down the Tudor River uh, drainage basin and blocked that uh, drainage area. Well, this area of Mount St. Helens, uh, north of Mount St. Helens, was the site of intense uh, uh, geologic activity. Up to 600 feet of strata formed here at this location. 600 feet of strata is, is a hard to believe, but since 1980, since May 18, 1980, up to 600 feet of deposits have formed here. And this area has been eroded since then to uh, show us some of the 600 feet of deposits that have formed here. What is amazing is the uh, minute layering that formed in uh, some of these deposits. We have historic observation and eyewitness reports and photographs of this area repeatedly between the eruptions showing us the sequence of which these deposits formed. Each layer has a date and I'm fascinated as I study these layers because each layer represents a geologic catastrophe formed since 1980. The uh, valley of the Tootle River, the North Fork of the Tootle River, was blocked by landslide material. For two years, it laid blocked by about three-eighths of a cubic mile of landslide material. It was unblocked by a mud flow on March 19, 1982. A giant mud flow from a, a, a lake behind the, the lava dome in Mount St. Helens came down over this area. This mud flow gouged out the dam and breached the dam, and as a result, a whole new series of channels were cut, and the upper part of the drainage basin of the, the Tudor River was established into the Spirit Lake area. For two years, there was no outlet for Spirit Lake, and the whole upper drainage basin of the Tudor River was isolated from the Pacific Ocean. It was unblocked on March 19, 1982, by mud flow. This mud flow caused very severe damage. From the air, you can see this, where this breach occurred. The mud came down through here, breached through that dam, and made a whole branching tree-like drainage pattern of incredible complexity. 
Well, those clips reinforce the ideas we've been studying throughout our chapter, and I wish I had time to show you more. It's a very intriguing video and a very good argument for uh, the creationist and Christian beliefs, but I'm sure you'd like to have some time to review before your test. So um, we're going to stop with that. But this um, backs up our idea that a cataclysm, a uh, one-time um, catastrophic event and not uniformitarianism shaped the earth as we see it today. And he went on to show some footage of the Grand Canyon and some questions about how the Grand Canyon could have been eroded. And it looked very similar. It's like uh, the canyon he just showed us is like a little miniature Grand Canyon. But you should have completed the chapter review from your textbook already. And you might want to be sure that that has been graded before proceeding with the program because we're going to be working on the review activity now together. And this is activity 2-4. It's called Distinguishing Terms, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, very simple directions underline the word or phrase that best completes each sentence. So. Uh, just grab that and we'll do that quickly together and it should be pretty quickly if you find that you're struggling you might want to pause see if you can uh, think of the answer if I don't give you enough time maybe check in your book but by this point after having completed the chapter review and having that graded you should be able to pretty quickly answer these questions alright so you're underlining and let's start together with number one according to 2 Peter 3 5 Modern man is willingly ignorant or deceived about creation and the flood. All right, we've said that every day, this chapter, willingly ignorant. Man purposely does not want to understand or believe this. Um, willingly, willingly ignorant. He does not want to understand or look for evidence of creation. Okay, number two. Christians believe most of the Earth's features were changed as a result of a cataclysm or uniformitarianism. Okay, and that's one we just discussed. We believe uh, most of the features were changed as a result of a cataclysm, specifically the flood. Number three, the water on the Earth's surface is called the lithosphere or the hydrosphere. Okay, think of hydroplane. Hydro means water, hydrosphere. Number four, the mantle or the core is the fluid layer of rock under the Earth's crust. It's going to be the mantle, isn't it? The mantle under the crust, the core is at the core, at the center. Number five, some geographers debate whether Europe or Australia is really a continent. Okay, they are debating about Europe because of uh, the fact that it is connected physically to Asia, and sometimes that's referred to as Eurasia but others refer to it as two separate continents, Europe and Asia. All right, number six, the largest islands in the world are the continental or the oceanic islands. Continental would be an extension of a continent, and oceanic would be those rising from the ocean floor. continental. And uh, you might recall the terms sile and sima. The sile is what the continents are uh, made of. And here you can see a continent rising from the sile. And this is a continental island. It's attached to the same um, land or sile that the continent comes from. The sima or sima is the bottom of the ocean, the ocean floor you'll recall. And an oceanic island rises from the ocean floor. So that's the difference um, of the two islands. Okay, and continental are the largest islands. All right. Number seven, the largest continental landmass is Africa or Eurasia. It's a pretty simple one. That would be Eurasia. 
Number eight, the four oceans are the Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, and Arctic or Antarctic. And that is going to be the Arctic Ocean, Arctic. Number nine, the largest ocean in the world is the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean? The Pacific is the largest ocean. Number 10, Mount Everest or Mount McKinley rises higher than any other mountain on the Earth. Mount Everest, you've probably known that for years, so that's a free one. Number 11, the most influential physical feature in the development of climate and culture is mountain ranges or river systems. What's the most influential? It's going to be mountain ranges. Mountain ranges. Number 12, the best agricultural land is found on the world's plains or plateaus? Plains or plateaus? Best land for farming is found on the plains. Number 13, plateaus are sometimes called basins or tablelands. Okay, that's going to be tablelands. Think of your song, Higher Ground. Lord, lift me up to higher uh, ground, heaven's tableland. Number 14, the longest river in the world is the Nile or the Amazon? Now, that's going to be the Nile River. We did discuss several ways to compare rivers, as, and the Amazon is the top of many of those ways, but as far as length goes, the Nile is still the longest, although it doesn't have, uh, doesn't drain near as great an area or have as much discharge. Okay, number 15, the Amazon River has the largest drainage basin or volume of trade in the world. Okay, it has the largest drainage basin. It's also very navigable, but doesn't have the greatest volume of trade. We're 16. One of the most important measurements of a river's value for mankind is its discharge or navigability. That's going to be its navigability. How far can a ship travel along the river? Number 17, the largest lake in the world is the Caspian Sea or Lake Baikal? And that's going to be the Caspian Sea. And it is classified as a lake, according to your book, because it is landlocked, even though it is salt water. Number 18, seas are larger or smaller than oceans? Seas are going to be smaller and generally safer than being out on the open ocean. Number 19, a fault or a depositional mountain is an example of tectonic activity. Okay, a fault is an example of tectonic activity. Depositional mountain is created by deposits. Number 20, according to the continental drift or plate tectonics theory, the Earth was once united into a supercontinent called Pangaea. Which theory? Okay, there's, they do play off of each other, but that's going to be our continental drift theory. Continental drift. 21, weathering or erosion carries away sand and soil to form sand dunes and barrier islands. Okay, it's going to be erosion. Weathering breaks the um, objects down to little pieces of sand and soil, and erosion carries those pieces away. 22, decayed substances produced by living organisms are called alluvium 
or humus. Okay, that produced by living organisms, humus. So think of human as a living person. Maybe that might help you. I don't know. Humus is the correct answer there. Okay, I hope that you did well on those and that you thought of the answers quickly and easily. That'll make you feel good about taking your test, which is time for now. We'll just look at it real quickly. Um, I did go over the first test with you, and the tests are pretty much set up the same way every time, although um, I didn't really have as much time on the first test as I would have liked to have to talk to you about it. But when you're taking your test, you want to be sure to read carefully. You probably get tired of hearing these things, but still it's always worth um, saying one more time. On your multiple choice, read carefully. Look especially for the italicized words. See this here? Which of the following is not one of the world's four principal bodies of water? Make sure that you read each choice carefully, write legibly. It's best to use capital letters. Uh, don't forget to turn your pages over since there are a few pages. On your short answer, you just write a word or sometimes a phrase to answer those questions. Then you do have a third page that begins with matching. Um, I always like to kind of just count through and see, am I going to use any of them twice? Am I going to have any left over? And so on. They don't guarantee to always match up exactly every time. True, false, it's best to write the entire word. So write the whole word out uh, so that your grader can clearly see whether it's true or false. And just take the sentence for what it's worth. Don't try to overthink it. Uh, just take it at face value. And then don't forget to turn your page over. There is another matching section, matching two. And then you do have essay. Mark through that optional. This is not optional. By ninth grade, you should be able to answer an essay easily. What is the probable explanation for the formation of the Grand Canyon? We talked about that um, in, in some of the lessons, and it was also mentioned in your textbook. So you should write in complete sentences and use some details to support your answer. And then number 50, describe the layers of the Earth. So you might want to list the layers in, in your first sentence and then tell a detail about each layer um, or a few details about each layer and make sure that you write in complete sentences. All right, so at this point, you may pause the program to begin your test. I hope that you did well on your test. Be sure that it is graded before you proceed. I'm not going to go over every answer with you. Most of them are self-explanatory, and whoever graded it would have the page number there if you need to look something up. Um, just briefly, I will talk to you about the true faults, um, in case you're wondering why something was uh, marked incorrectly there. Number 33 was faults. Plateaus, plateaus are mountainous lowlands with good soil. Plateaus are not lowlands, remember they're highlands or tablelands, and they don't have good soil. It's the plains that have the good soil. Uh, 34 was true, hope you remembered that. 35 uh, is false. The Atlantic and Pacific together make up the world ocean. That is false because the world ocean is made up of the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Arctic and Arctic Ocean. So all four of the oceans needed to be listed in order for that to be true. Number 36 is also false. The terms sea and ocean carry the same meaning. Um, a sea is actually referred to as an arm of the ocean. It's smaller than an ocean, and it's more protected than um, being on, out on the open ocean. 37 and 38 were true, so hopefully you don't have a uh, question on those. 39, a continental island is an island in a lake on a large continent. And we just looked at... Um, the diagram of that, and we saw that a continental island is one that rises from the sile. It's on the same, it's from the same part of the Earth's crust as the continents are. It's not from the sima or the ocean floor. Okay, and then uh, just briefly some suggestions for the essay questions. 
What is the probable explanation for the formation of the Grand Canyon? We talked about that before, and it has to do with the flood, doesn't it? Remember that the flood waters softened the surface of the earth. We did our little cement demonstration, and even though the cement was dry, I could easily break it, which I am not normally a person that's strong enough to break cement. And the ground similarly probably stayed soft for hundreds of years. And so the flood itself would have uh, made a lot of changes, but also earthquakes, volcanoes, as we just saw uh, on the Mount, Mount St. Helen clips, uh, floods, huge inland seas would have been created by the uh, receding floodwaters. All of those would have um, made a lot of changes in the surface of the earth. And erosion would have happened very quickly because of the softness of the soil, the earth's surface. And so the Grand Canyon was probably formed during this time. And um, if you want some more information on that, you can look in your textbook on page 18. But it was probably during or after that time period of the flood when the Earth's crust was very soft. Number 50, describe the layers of the Earth. And uh, there are three main layers. We talked about the crust, the mantle, and the core. Those are the main layers. And the crust is going to be your thin outer layer. Remember, it has two parts, the cyma and the sile, which we also talked about earlier. The cyma, cyma covers the whole Earth. It's the bottom of the ocean, the ocean floor, we could say. While the sile is just the slabs of rock on top of that, forming the continents and any continental islands. Uh, the mantle is our middle layer. It's got a hot, um, it's made up of a hot fluid material, molten material and the core is the innermost layer and hopefully remember that it has two parts an outer core that's made out of liquid and a solid inner core and uh, scientists believe because of the properties of the earth and the studies they've done that the core um, consists consists of iron and nickel and it's probably okay if you didn't remember the specific you know what uh, the elements were that, it's, that they believe it consists of. But you should at least get the three layers and give some details about both of them. And you can read more about that on page 20 if you're wondering, oh, you know, did we really learn that? I don't remember that. All right? You want to be sure to uh, check with mom or dad, whoever's grading your paper, to explain any other questions you might have. Get the page numbers, look it up, and try to have a good understanding because remember that we are building on the concepts from these first um, chapters. We're going to build on these ideas throughout the year. All right, and that brings us to chapter three, and we're just going to have a little preview of what's coming up in our next chapter. And our topic of chapter three is climate, so that's something that everybody's pretty familiar with, and hopefully a lot of it will be review. It should make it nice and easy for you. Get your grade padded here at the beginning with uh, some easy work. And in this chapter, we're going to spend time looking at some concepts um, that you've probably most likely seen before in science, maybe even earth science if you took that. And we're not going to go into all the details that you might have learned in earth science. So I'm not going to be getting down to the really nitty gritty, but you should be able to brush up on your facts and see how this information relates to geography and get the general concepts down. So once again, you can build on those. These are the idea or this is the main idea for chapter three that we'll be looking at. God has designed the atmosphere to distribute heat and water around the earth. Okay, so that's the big picture of our climate chapter. That's pretty much what climate has to do with, how hot it is or cool it is and how dry or wet the area is. That's what our climate deals with. And we do have some goals, of course, that we'll be tackling during this chapter. Um, by the end of this chapter, you're going to be able to identify the five imaginary lines that mark the limits of the sun's direct and slanted rays. They might even come to mind right now. Also label the three latitude zones. I'm going to describe the Coriolis effect on wind direction. Identify the wind belts. Describe the cause of ocean currents. Identify the elements of the hydrologic cycle. Distinguish the three situations that produce precipitation. Distinguish the 12 major divisions of climate. And that'll definitely come up a lot during our um, year. 
also describe the three basic biomes. And finally, distinguish the four types of forests. Now, hopefully that doesn't scare you off. Some of those you might be thinking, oh, I know that already. That's good. You've got a little head start. And then just think how brilliant you'll be once we get done with this chapter. You'll know all about those things. And they'll seem really easy by that point. Now, uh, we do have a new verse for this chapter, so let's take a look at that together. Genesis 8, 22. Go ahead and read along with me. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So there we have God's promise about our seasons and our climates, what we're studying. He promises that as long as the earth is here, these things are going to be rem going to remain. They are going to happen. They're going to be um, consistent. They do have a lot of variety. There is variation, but they always will remain. God promises us. Also, as we study climate, you're going to continue working on your semester project. I hope that you have been working on that. I'll try to remind you periodically to get busy on your geography island. By now, you should have completed these beginning steps. Uh, first of all, you were to draw an outline of an island on a sheet of 8.5 by 11 paper and take up most of the page with your island. All right, so that should be done. Name your island. You should have picked out a name by now. And also, you were to place at least 10 geographical features on your map and name them. And uh, choose from the features on pages 24 and 25 of your textbook. So if you haven't gotten that far yet, you need to go ahead and get busy on that. Um, today because if you haven't gotten that far then you're going to be falling a little bit behind. Now in this chapter we're going to learn about particularly about climate and vegetation and you'll be adding those to your map collection. And here here is the sample just to remind you if you haven't gotten very far that's the basic um, naming the island and putting some features on it and then you want to make several copies just Xerox some run down to Kinko's or somewhere where maybe you have a Xeroxer right there at home. Xerox, that's just a Xerox copy. And then you can add on to it. And um, here's an example of the geographical features that have been drawn on. I know you can't see a lot, but you can get an idea of the features drawn on there and um, colored in. This shows the climate and precip precipitation. That's an example. And you'll need to um, wait until we get into the chapter a little bit before you start adding this because there are several things that influence climate. Part of it will have to do with where you choose uh, to place your island. Here uh, is a desert and dry, hot climate. You can see the colors are different, just a little bit of different shading there. It might have to do with what other geographical features are nearby. And then um, we'll also be learning about the winds, which are going to influence the climate, and then here this student has labeled the prevailing ocean currents, which have an influence on the climate as well. And of course, you'll need to have a key. And here she has precipitation in inches per year and the three different colors. So uh, there are more options also, depending on where your island is. And then I'll uh, be talking a little bit about vegetation as well. And here you can see this is a little more complex. Here's her vegetation key. Uh, she even has one for originally and now, before, uh, before the island was settled and after it was settled. So there's a different um, section. And of course, the climate and the local features are going to influence volcanic rocks, so there's no vegetation there. Part of this uh, she had on her climate was desert, so there's not going to be um, as much there. OK, desert. Here's this desert right here. So that's uh, what you're going to be working on this chapter. So you have no assignment other than um, if you haven't worked on your geography island yet, you'll need to get started on that. Other than that, you're home free since you've taken a test today. You get a little break. All right, let's check out the answer to our where in the world. See if you found out where is the city of Cologne, which is famous for its scent. It is in Germany, and I've been able to visit it. Um, when I was over in Europe one time. All right, we're not going to have a new question this time. Home free on that one too, and I'll see you next time.